Good morning, Love Life. You guys made my day by bringing your kiddos in here. It's been exciting. I, I'm, still, I, I'm still not engaged yet because I, there's no crying in the nursery. I, I, I'm waiting for the babies to be screaming and crying. They don't do it a long period of time, just a little bit, just so I can go, okay, okay, we're there. But it's still too quiet. And I never in my life would ever think that I would say, I'm enjoying the quiet, I'm enjoying, I want noise. And it's been too quiet for too long. It's not a reopening, by the way, it's a regathering. We've never been closed, just so you know that. We have not been closed. We have been doing the ministry and and we've been making uh, love life impact the world. And I'm excited about what y'all are doing in, in your position of, of believers and staying strong and, and looking up and not down. You know, ultimately, you got to realize something. This is what separates us from the religions of the world. And that is, it is a relationship, a personal relationship with God. And that is so, so vital to understand in just the foundation of your life because ultimately this is what i see this is a problem i see we get so focused outward of what's going on with everybody we get sucked in into the pain into the worry into the confusion into the fear because we're too we're looking out there and we're going god and and god do something But see, it's never shown here that God is this. God's about this. And you see it clearly in the life of Jesus, specifically when stuff was going on, stuff was going on. But when a person engaged, when a person connected, that's when we got a story. That's when we got a miracle. That's when we got something big happening. But it's that personal connection. And I'm going to tell you something. You can oh, pray for Phoenix. Pray for Glendale. Pray for, and, and we all want to do that. But listen, you got to look to here in the sense of, I've got to look to my connection with my father. Believe me, what happens is your viewpoint changes concerning the cities concerning the state, concerning the nation. It's not a, I don't care, but what happens is you become so empowered and strengthened by your personal walk that you start glowing. You start making an impact. We all want God to do something. No, we do something. Listen, listen, let me tell you something. God did do something. Jesus went to the cross it's so sad what happens with people because we get so focused in on us in the natural. But we need to be concerned of us in the supernatural. And that's why a relationship. And it is not tied to, are you reading your Bible every day? Are you praying every day? That is a religious concept that stops people from a relationship. The word of God should be living in you. So, of course, you need to hear it. You need to pay attention to it. You need to read it. But it needs to be in you. In the book itself won't do anything. It has to be alive. It's talked as seed. It's shown as seed. And Jesus made it clear that this is what it is, seed. But seed is just what it is. You got a picture of something, but you'll never partake of it until... You plant the seed in the ground. Once you plant the seed in the ground, then and only then can you be able to have the opportunity to partake of the harvest of the picture. Are you guys hearing me? I'm talking about this. Until this gets off the package and into the ground, your heart, it can't produce It's not that God doesn't want it to produce. It can't produce. I can sit here and say, I want corn and I want a bunch of corn. And I take my corn seed and I throw the packages on the ground. I go, look at that. I got all kinds of corn, thousands and thousands of seeds. I can't wait to eat it. And what's going to happen? Nothing. 
Why? Because I just got a bunch of Bibles on the ground. I'm waiting for them to do something. Just like I look at God, I want him to do something. And that's not how it works, people. And you should be happy about that because what I'm talking about is God in you. You and the Father. You and, the, and, and Jesus operating according to what that says is life. And that's the only way you're going to get life. So what we've been talking about, well, I did a couple weeks ago, is the rapture. Freaks people out. Now you'd think that going to heaven would be something exciting. Meeting Jesus in the middle of the air would be exciting. But what happens is, is we get so small focused, we don't understand exactly why or what is going on. And I can understand that because I was there once. I was there, I, 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 I became a youth pastor and I worked with teens for years. And I could understand their turmoil because I was the same way. Like, I don't want to hear about the rapture, man. I want, I want to get married. I want to have a kid. I want to, I want, I want, I want, you know, and we think that what God is doing is he's interrupting real life. But see, I didn't get it. I get it so much because we don't have the full understanding or knowledge of why any of this is in here. Do you understand that this information was written and shown as a teaching? 2,000 years ago, as if it was today. In other words, they were talking about this stuff 2,000 years ago. Now think about it. God wrote the scripture through men. These men being influenced by the Holy Spirit wrote the scripture as God breathed the words. Now, did God know that there was going to be a 2,000-year delay? Did God know that this was way out there? So what are we talking about it now for? Because there's no way in the world is any of this stuff going to happen for thousands of years. So why even put it in there? And that's what we have to look at. See, the Word of God is yesterday, today, and forever. It never changes. It's, it's perfect and when God wrote it then, he was writing it for today, today, and he was writing it for a thousand years from now. His word doesn't change. Our viewpoint of what we're reading affects how we feel. That's why religion can use it to beat you down. Because most people don't know the scriptures. They don't know the Bible. They know religious concepts or what they've been told but they don't really know it. So when you are lacking of knowledge, you can be what? Deceived. And the scripture talks about don't be deceived. Well, if it's telling us not to be deceived, what's it saying? It's saying that we should have knowledge and the knowledge is there. God wants all of us to understand. That's why when he told Daniel, when he was talking about the end times, he said, no one understand. That's the God we serve. He's not trying to hide nothing from you. He's not trying to give only you the easy stuff and the pastor gets the strong stuff because he's so much more spiritual than you all. Uh-uh. No. No. It's what do you want? What, what, what do you want from this? See, that's what got me to where I'm at and will continue to get me where I need to go. And that is, I'm crazy about it. I love it. I love everything about it. You know what? You know what? There was a time when I didn't, when it was scary, when there were certain scriptures I wouldn't go read. There was a time I felt that way. There was a time when I would bypass books to get to something that was more connected to what I wanted. It sounded selfish, didn't it? I'm sounding like some of you now. No, I'm just kidding. But do you see what I'm saying? In other words, the process of this was a journey. Just like life itself, it's a journey. And so when scripture gives you 
some instruction, information. And then it says, after the information, it says, comfort one another with this. Then that means that the information should comfort you. Right? I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I like to dumb things down. I like to make it simple. I believe that foundations are built on simple, not hard. Hard comes after simple. One plus one equals two. Simple. No, not one time it wasn't. One time it was difficult. But we learned the elementary principles of the ABCs. Math, everything. And we built upon that. That is called the journey of life. What happens is, is we get into church thing and we don't major on the journey. We major on how much do you know? Now, according to the scripture, you're a new creation. You're brand new. You're a baby. Well, how much does a baby know? Nothing. And then what do we do? We start pointing at people and saying, you should know. You should be this. You should understand this. The truth is, you should be able to turn to that person and go, no, I shouldn't. I'm a baby. I'm new. Why would I know this stuff? And that's the problem with religion. It's trying to make you graduate from first grade to senior in high school or to college. And we look at that natural life and go, that's crazy. That's crazy. You don't do that. Exactly. And you don't do that in this faith. That's why y'all, some of you need to chill in this walk and start getting it to become simple here. That's where the transformation takes place. Until you can get the simple, God loves me, never leave me, never forsake me. I am saved by his grace, not by works. And when I get this information in me, then I can start building upon the other areas, the areas of talking with God. We tend to call prayer, which is just an information of different types of connection with God. It's not one word for prayer. There's many words for prayer. But we don't look at it that way because it's religious. So we say we have to pray. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, how will be thy name? And then we get real weird. Why? Because religion dictated that. You don't see a friend and go, oh, Sasha, how are you today? Your day going smooth? You don't do that, do you? No. Okay, well, she's just, she's my, uh, one of my employees. I need to have a hierarchy, and then I should talk that way. I need a boss. Oh, boss. No, we don't do that. But that's what's created in the religious concept of this Christian faith. Just talk. In different ways, you're going to talk to him. When it has to do with needs being met, you don't go, God, please, please, God. Why? Because you understand the Bible. And the Bible says you have those things. He meets your needs. So all of a sudden, you change how you communicate with that understanding. When you don't understand, it's beg, beg, beg. When you do understand, it's, this belongs to me, so I receive it. That's all it is. It's understanding what scripture says. So when we look at the rapture, you go, what, what's up with the rapture? The rapture's important for one thing. We gotta get out of the way for a moment in time. That's all the rapture is. Getting a church period a time period, a piece of time that's been cut in in the first place. See, through the whole Old Testament, there's nothing written about the church. In the Gospels, there's nothing about the church. The church doesn't happen until Jesus is risen again and the disciples are at the gathering in the book of Acts. That's when the church begins. When the Holy Spirit falls upon them, that's the beginning of, quote, the mystery of the church. 
the mystery of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The mystery, the mystery that no one saw coming. No one except Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that mystery was then revealed. Now think about this, because when you understand in time, do you understand how this works and why it is the way it is? Because according to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, not for God so loved Israel, though he loves Israel, but it isn't for God so loved Israel, for God so loved the world, me, you. Are you guys hearing me? Now think about that, because if we're looking at the world concept, if you revert to Israel concept, there ain't no world concept. It's all about Israel. So you go through the whole Old Testament process, it's all about Israel, all about Israel, all about Israel, all about Israel. Jesus comes, all about Israel. He even says, I didn't come for the Gentiles, all about Israel. It's all about Israel. Until when? Until he goes to the cross. Once he goes to the cross, that opens the door for a new time dispensation, a new time period where God is going to become totally different in how he reacts to. Because there's different dispensations in Scripture of how God dealt with people from the beginning of Adam all the way through to the church age. Now think about this, because when you start seeing that, you go, okay, so the rapture is really about us getting out of the way because we're the church age, the world, for God to fix something that is still broken. And it's only seven years. That's it, seven years. So what we looked at two weeks ago is this, is that when you look at why this is happening, you start understanding all the other concepts of what religion tries to place before us to scare you. But when you understand truth, there's no fear in it at all. There's no fear in it. There's so many people out there, and I'm talking about Christian churches and everything, that do everything they can to make you look at your life and say, if you do this, you will lose this. They, they thrive on that. I'm telling you, they thrive on it because it is a place of control. If I tell you, you can do whatever you want, I don't have control over you. Guess what the Bible says? You can do whatever you want. Anything. Even Paul said, everything's lawful. Everything I do is lawful. In other words, I can choose to do whatever I want. He said, but not everything I do is going to benefit me. Are you guys hearing me? So see, what I, I'm telling you, this is how it works, because I've been there, done that. I know what a lot of these pastors do is they want to control for the purpose of their desire. And so the only way I can really control you is by intimidation and fear. Oh, are you doing what? How many times have you done that? Oh, you continue doing that. But see, I will never touch myself or my family that way, just y'all. How do I know that? Because I know these pastors. And that's how they operate. It's a control issue, fear. But when you talk about grace, there is no control. It's all his control. It all now comes down to you and him, you and Jesus. And that's what grace is about. You see, you wouldn't, un and I'm talking about a loving home. You wouldn't run your own family the way religion does. No way in the world. Could you imagine running your kid's room and say, oh, that's the third time you did it. You're getting kicked out of this house. You, you don't stop doing that. You go to that five-year-old. I've told you 20 times this week to clean this room, and you continue to disobey me 20 times. That's, that's not just by chance. You are making it a part of your life to disobey me. You're out of the home. You're, you're out. Parents, is that happening? I didn't say, did you think about that? I said, is that happening? Heck no. Heck no. But see, we love so much more than God, of course, don't we? No, we don't. It's, it's, it's a lack of understanding. 
So what they do is for tribulation, they want to intimidate you and say, if you don't change, if you don't stop this, you will go through tribulation. Scripture is completely contrary to that. Scripture is very clear on God delivering his people from wrath or judgment. Very clear on it. Noah. All you have to do is look at Noah. Oh, let me ask you something. Noah built an ark to be delivered from a flood, correct? Noah was a righteous man, correct? How about his family? Were they perfect? Not at all. But they get delivered. Yeah. Wait a minute. How did a couple nasty ones get delivered in the ark? Because they believed in a covenant. And because of that belief in the covenant, not because they made themselves perfect or that they were sinless, they believed in the covenant and they got in the ark. Oh, what about Lot? Anybody know who Lot is? Was he a righteous man? Oh, wait a minute, didn't God speak to Abraham? Abraham said, would you leave a righteous? Was he righteous? No, stick to your nose because you're right. I don't want to, you guys all freaked out right now. Oh my gosh. No, he wasn't righteous. But what, what made Abraham be able to communicate, communicate that to God and God to deliver him? Because Lot believed in the covenant, though his life was messed up. His family was messed up. I mean, his daughters were freaks. If you know the story, you know what I'm talking about, right? They get delivered, and all of a sudden they're going, well, we might as well have babies by our father. That ain't normal, and that isn't righteous. Wait a minute. Did not God deliver the righteous from Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh, we got a dilemma here, because when we look at that family, they all messed up. I think they should have stayed there. Why are they living there? They must have enjoyed it. Covenant. Belief. It's all it's about, people. But God delivered from what? Before wrath. Before judgment. Here we have, quote, what believers are, the body of Christ. By his blood. But he's going to leave some of us back because we can't Stop sinning. Newsflash, you have never stopped sinning. Your nature is no longer sin, but you've never stopped sinning. And a lot of these pastors that want to preach this goofiness sin all the time by their gossip, their division, their evil communication. They sin constantly. They should be proclaiming they are going in the rapture, but they will never do that. Because those sins are acceptable to them. But if you do your sins, and you continue to do them, you're going to tribulation. Don't take the mark. God. See, this word sets free. People that have a problem with what I'm talking about is because you've got a problem in your life right now. And the problem is this, you messed up and you judge yourself harshly. And because of that, you deem it necessary to believe of the judgment only because of you and what you're doing. So you believe because of your hidden sins, the ones that no one knows about, especially since you're in church. And you can't stand it. And you hate yourself for these things. And you go through this life of judgment, judgment, judgment. And so you look out there and go, no, ha they have to be judged. When actually you're just saying what you believe about you. But you don't want judgment. You just don't know how to be free. And I get that. I understand that. You know why? Because freedom can never come by your process of judgment. It's impossible. Until you allow his judgment to take place. Well, that's what I, I, I do. I, 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 I want him judging. Okay, I, I'm going to tell you he did judge you. 
He went to that cross and judged your sin, the curse. He judged you and he took it upon himself. You've been judged. Yeah, but what about my life? Your life is because you've chosen not to renew this. And until you renew this, you're going to continue in that. Pornography didn't just jump on you. Lying didn't just jump on you. None of this stuff just jumped on you. No one battles a, quote, sin because it just jumped on you. No. No. You know what's happened is it's continued. And the continuation has created more bondage. That's all. And so your life is, I get it, condemned. You feel guilty. I get it. Why? Because that's what you've done. Guilt, 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 guilt. Condemn, condemn, condemn. And that's how you feel. I get it. But I'm not basing my life or my teaching on your feeling. I'm basing it on the word, truth. And that's all I can do. Because we can't get free people ever if we rely on righteousness by our works. It's impossible. It won't happen. You cannot turn into Jesus and all of a sudden be righteous in everything you do, then you could have went to the cross. But that was shown impossible. Why? Because of sin nature. But now I have a new nature. Christians that receive Jesus, according to the Bible, again, which I believe most Christians believe, you're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Okay, and what? Nothing. Because what that statement is, is that's what happened to the real you, your spirit, the inside, who you really are. If you want to look at it correctly, picture a glove. You put a glove on the ground, put it on a table, and all you see is a glove. But once you put the hand in the glove, then all of a sudden, the glove starts moving. The glove starts being used. Exactly. We're looking at the glove more than the hand inside the glove. I thought that was really good, by the way. I just, just came. So what we're doing is, is we're, we're not looking correctly. Now, you, may be, you might be thinking, well, I, I just don't know how. And I, because it's this. This is how we deal with our world. This is how we operate in life. How we think. As a man or woman processes a thought, so are they. And until you change this, renew this, everything in how you act and react stays the same. I can tell you right now, there are people in here that have had, quote, and I'm not talking about Christian, Christianity, I'm not talking about Bible, I'm not talking about anything. You've had life-changing experiences by changing information. In your jobs, in your marriage, in a relationship, you went, you know what, I got to stop doing that. I got to stop being that way. And so you started changing how you reacted, how you acted towards someone. Come on, anybody ever been there in anything in life? Of course you have. That is the process of renewing your mind. We make it again a super spiritual thing. No, it's renewing your mind. Everybody can do it. And you can change how you are. The thing is, is even if you don't know Jesus, you can do that. People have done it. But the Jesus thing is the eternal thing. I just want my life right now to be doing the right thing. Why? Because I have responsibility. What responsibility? The one Jesus gave me. He did that so that I could do what? Impact the world as he did. He was just in his little area. But for God so loved the world. For God so loved what? The world. Did Jesus come to Phoenix? Actually, he did. Just look around. That's how he did it. 
When are you, you going to start talking about the rapture? I have been talking about the rapture the whole time. This whole time. See, when you understand the Old Testament and what happened to Israel, at David's death, to the point of Israel going into captivity, that's when Babylon took them into captivity, you have a time period where it was Israel in a life of total and complete sin and disregard to Scripture. Now remember, we're talking about Old Testament. We're talking about law. We're talking about legalism. We're talking about you better obey or else. That's the law. That's the Old Testament. So what you have is you have this period of time where God says, all right, you done screwed around too much. Now that's something, isn't it? Because the length of time was 490 years. I don't know about you, but when I read stuff like that, I'm thinking, God, I think you would have known after 20 years how screwed up they were. And see, that's what grace is. We don't look at it that way. God judged Israel. After 490 years, God is long-suffering even in law. But we don't want to read it that way. But you need to read it that way. You need to see that. You need to recognize that there's so much grace, even in the Old Testament, where God finally says, okay, that you guys, you, it's your choice. I don't want that. How do I know that? All you have to do is read the prophets. Read, read Isaiah. Read the different prophets. And they, they, God sends them. Even Jesus said, God sent them the prophets, and you killed them. He's always trying to help. He's always trying to benefit. But ultimately, in the Old Testament, he's limited. And so what we have is we have this picture of Israel in defiance of God, ultimately in captivity, and God says, you owe me 70 years. The reason why they owe them, owe God, seven years is because they did not fulfill his law of each seventh year, the Sabbath must let the land rest. This is what people do today. We prosper, we prosper, and instead of resting in God's goodness and God's faithfulness to us, we say, we got to keep working, keep working, keep working. We do it all the time. We're so focused in on getting stuff that don't really mean nothing. It doesn't. I mean, don't get me wrong, stuff is good. There's a lot of good stuff, and there are stuffs that's better than other stuff. I'm not saying anything that negative about it. I'm saying is your life is surrounded or revolves around stuff. That's when it's messed up. But you can have stuff. A lot of you want a better stuff car or a better stuff truck or a better, better stuff house. You got five kids living in a one-bedroom apartment. You better want better stuff. And God isn't going, no, no, stayeth thereeth. No, he's not. He's probably been yelling at you going, get out of this place. Believe me for bigger. That's my, listen, if I would be that way as a father, God loves greater than I do. God loves way greater than I do. So, of course, he's, the stuff isn't an issue. It's just, is the stuff owning you? And if it is, your life will show it. Everything, everything in life is based upon the picture of fruit. And it'll show it. It'll show it as stuff is number one for your life. But the thing is, is ultimately, you've got to look at your life and go, okay, what, i got to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is the truth, the information that we have before us. So we have a picture of Israel going into captivity and 70 years, seven. What we have is Israel fulfilling the sabbatical years that were stolen from the 490. And then that 70 years is the repayment of those seven, those Sabbaths, okay? The Sabbath rest years that were robbed, 490 years, 70, into 70 years captivity. Daniel, one of the Jews in captivity, wise young man, 
because he made a choice to continue to focus in on God. Everywhere in scripture, when you see a person stay focused in on God, they always get elevated all the time. It doesn't matter what king in Babylon took over, Daniel would always rise to the top. Why? Because he trusts God. Why is that important? Because y'all living in a Babylon. But not everybody rises to the top. Why? What are you believing? What are you looking at? That's why I tried to start at the very beginning. What? See, you're too focused on all that instead of focused on here. This takes care of all that. Your viewpoint changes how you look and see life. And that's why it's, it's so important to understand that. So when Daniel's going through his life in Babylon, in captivity, he ain't having a bad time. Why? Because he's committed to God. Even if he's threatened, it doesn't matter. He's committed to God. Are you committed? Because if you're not, I can understand how your life is really messed up. And that's not what God wants. There's always going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's always going to be messes out there. It doesn't matter where you live. There's going to be messes. Now, some messes are going to be more uh, amplified than others. It depends on the country you live in. You lack food here is different than lacking food in, in some African nations. Lacking food in some African nations, y'all going to die. Here, you're just not going to be able to buy, you know, organic for a while. In other words, it's, you know, you might, you know, have to wait a couple weeks for toilet paper. That's our dilemma. But we're in a different country. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just the truth. We're not living in another country. But I don't judge myself according to them. I judge myself according to where I am, just like y'all should be doing. So what we have to do is we look at this and we go, okay, so here we have this picture of Israel now being coming to a place of freedom. And this is what the, the thing is, is Daniel asked God. This is how awesome God is. Daniel asked God, what, what do we do? We're about to be freed. You're, see, he had the text. He had the information. 70 years are required. He knows it's 70 years are almost up. God, forgive us. What do we do? What's going to happen? And then God does this. He reveals everything. He reveals all the way to the end. But remember, the church age is a mystery. So it reveals the completed amount of time and that's what the disciples were looking at. Because if you remember the disciples, this is near the completed end of time of the 490 years. And this is where we get into Daniel. Go to Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24. God, what's happened? What's, what's going to happen to us? What do we need to know? And this is where God speaks to. 70 weeks that is 70 Shabuas, Hebrew word, which means sevens. Seven segments of sevens, seven periods, all right? Seventy weeks or 70 sevens are determined. That word determined literally means cut out. This time period is cut out. Seventy sevens are determined for your people for your holy city, and this is what God does. He goes now and explains, Daniel says, God, what is going to happen? What do we need to know? God now says, 77s are determined for your people, Jews, Israel, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision of prophecy, and anoint the most holy. He just laid out 490 year plan. Now y'all know 490 years has already gone and passed. So it, it, it didn't finish the way he said exactly. That's where we pay attention. He said 490 years from when you, when you get out, 409 years is going to take place for Israel. 70 
sevens are required for Israel. Everybody say Israel. Say it again. Not people, not Gentiles, not Arizonians. Seventy sevens are required for your people. Y'all have that? They robbed God of sabbatical years. Made it very clear, you don't go through the seventh year like the first six. You let the land rest. God has a reason for everything he does. Everything he does will be tied to prosperity and success. They, at the end of David's life, chose to prosper, but not stop. They continued on through. The seventh year came, they kept working the land. The seventh year came, they kept working the land. They just kept going and going. What they were doing is they were robbing God of the land that produces the sabbatical. That's so important to understand. It's, it's, this actually, the sabbatical is tied to our faith. When you look at seven, it's tied to perfection, but it's also tied to rest. If you notice in the world creation, the seventh year, there is no and day and night, and the seventh was done. You'll see it till the seventh. One day finished, two day finished. When it gets the seventh, there's no day and evening finish. Why? Because God's mindset was is, we're living, or should be living, a rest period in faith in Him, believing in Him, trusting Him, not working, 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 trust, rest. It got disrupted, though, when Adam sinned. And in that disruption, it caused confusion. It caused a curse. It caused all kinds of negatives to where we now, they then entered into a whole different life of the, uh, ultimately the law. But it, it's not a simple, simple transition anymore. Now it's tied to, will you believe me? Will you enter into my rest? God told Israel. Will you enter into my rest? Will you trust me? There's going to be battles. There's going to be war. There's going to be issues you deal with. But can you trust me? And they couldn't. Hebrews says they couldn't trust him. So they couldn't enter into his rest. That's all God wants us to do. If you look at it, you're thinking, really? So God's really saying, I need to really chill in my life and let him do what he wants to do? Let him accomplish all the things he wants to accomplish? Yes, that's exactly what he wants. But we're too busy forcing it and making it and trying to dictate and God's saying, listen, I don't care if you want to be a doctor or you want to sell ice cream. I don't care. I don't care if you want to be a dentist or a dog catcher. He doesn't care. It's not, it's not affecting his vision for the world. What he cares about is that you focus in those things and you live a life of character and honor to him and be the best dog catcher in the whole state of Arizona with salt and light in your life. Being the best dentist with salt and light in your life. Being the best carpenter. I want to be a realtor. Be the best. See, that it's not an issue. Why? Because for God so loved the world. He didn't say, for God so loved the church. For God so loved the world. I was out there. I came into the church. But my life out there is the influence that I'm supposed to be. So when I go to Safeway, or when I go to get gas at QT or Circle K, Circle K because we get fries discounts. By the way, I need to use, I got 40 cents. Good when you get that 40 cents off a gallon. Rich, 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 I tell you. And I need it, too, because I'm out of gas. Out of gas. Let me just reflect on this for a minute. The good life. So what we have is, is we have a picture. It's all about Israel. It's all about the Jews. That's all. It's what this is about. 
And so we have the picture where he says, this is what's going to happen. They were captive. Why? Because they disregarded God. And then we go into the, the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks are determined, cut out of time for your people, the Jews. Okay, he said to do what? To make an end of sin, reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up a vision. This is Daniel 9, 24, Daniel 9, verse 24. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint, cleanse the most holy. And that's the second advent. That's the second coming of Jesus. The rapture is not the second coming. He doesn't come. He meets us in the air. Do you understand that? He doesn't come to the earth. He meets us in the air. There's a reason for all this, all right? Verse 25. Daniel, know, therefore, and understand. I love that scripture because if he said it, Daniel, he said it to me. If he said it to me, he said it to you. Know and understand. So many Christians don't know and understand. And you know what happens? Deception! Deception! I'm, God says, do not be deceived. And what do people do? Get, get deceived. Why? Knowledge and understanding is lacking. That's the only way you get deceived. I can get deceived going in another country. Someone can come up to me off the street in another country and hand me, show me a hundred dollar, their hundred dollar bill and say, I, I got a good rate of transfer. You give me, you know, 10 of yours and I'll give you this hundred dollar. But see, I don't know the people. I don't know the picture. I don't know anything about that hundred dollar bill or a hundred dollars that they have. So on it is a picture of someone. I don't know who it is. The guy could have made a photocopy of one of their favorite actors. I don't know. And I say, 100 for 10? Good deal. I'll do it. Why? I'm going to be deceived because I don't know the picture of what's real. So the counterfeit can come up to me. How about if I had a $1,000 bill with Mickey Mouse's face on it? And I went up to you and I say, hey, you got $1,000. I'm going to trade you this bill. Just give me $1,000. We'll trade. And you look at it and you go, sure, I'll do it. No, you won't. Why? Because you know it's a counterfeit. You cannot be deceived. But if we're in small, some small country that we've never even been, don't even have a clue about, and we're there, we can't be deceived. Everybody got that? Y'all understand that? Okay, so we're not to be deceived. We need to have knowledge. This end time stuff, many people are deceived. Why? Because they don't understand. Tribulation, this is what it's all about. The tribulation, that's the whole thing. Tribulation, tribulation, tribulation. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Most Christians don't even understand why. We're having a seven-year tribulation. All of a sudden, God goes, you know what? I'm going to put seven years of hell on earth just so I can judge the church. What a bunch of idiots. That doesn't even make sense. Why is he throwing seven years in here? Scary stuff. Why? Because it was never fulfilled in God's word. To who? The Jews. And it has to reflect back to Jewish time. Which when Jesus went to the cross at 483 years, 490 are determined. At 480 three years he went to the cross. Exactly. Listen, we're not guessing on this. It's a historical fact. 483 years from the rebuilding of the temple to that point, 483 years. 49 years to rebuild, 483 years to Jesus. It's fact. It's not hearsay. It's fact. Historical fact. It's on tablets, thousands of years old. It's fact. The disciples are going, it's 40, we're, it's, we're almost here. Jesus, put me on your right hand. Jesus, put me on your left hand. You got moms with their disciples. Let my son be a ruler with you. What are they seeing? What are they thinking? Hosanna, Hosanna. What are they talking about? This is all about the Messiah. 490 years are up. This is the second advent, second coming. But guess what? Jesus goes to the cross. Woo, screws up everybody. They're all like going, we're quit. 
And that's what we see in scripture. They all walk away. Gosh, it's over. I go back to fishing. I sucked. I still suck now. Just going back to what we know. Jesus is dead. We thought the Messiah came. It's the time period. But oh, 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 oh. What did Jesus do? He comes back and goes, hey, guys. You're going to need to hang out, get together. And the church is going to start. What? what? What's, what's that? What are you talking about? What, church? What's a church? No one knows anything. It was a mystery. God had a plan for what? For God so loved the world. See, it's not about, about the world at all. To the cross, people, do you understand that? It's only been about the Jews. Rome is an authority. Jesus goes to the cross. It's over. Four and ninety years pass, nothing happens. Well, what happened? When he went to the cross, God stopped the time clock. It stopped. Because what happened is us. There had to be a time over 2,000 years where the world now could be impacted. Not Jews, though Jews are, but the whole world could come into the family of God. The whole world. The whole world. For thousands of years, the clocks stopped. See, seven years is missing. It has to be paid. But it couldn't have been paid then because no one could have been saved. Jesus had to go to the cross. And that's what it says here. Notice what it says. Verse 26. After 62 weeks, that's 434 years, Messiah shall be cut off. Remember, it's 49 and 434. That's 483. Okay, 49. Because they're broken down time periods. You've got the Israel, go build the temple. Go build. Go to your land. From that point, from the point of Cyrus saying, go build, that point to the building took 49 years. From that point, we have Jesus, 434 years. You guys see this? 434 years from the temple to Jesus is a total of 489. Just trust me on this. I did not go to Maryville, so I know what I'm talking about. In that weird, years later, I went to Trevor Brown. I still hate Maryville. Isn't that weird? Isn't that crazy? It doesn't even make sense. They had nothing to do with my life. It's just what's in me. I can't stand Panthers. Whatever. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, dude, you're off. I know. I do that, but that's okay. That's, that's mean you're getting the genuine me. I'm not a counterfeit. If your pastor gets freaky and dumb sometimes, you're going, yeah, that's him. That is him. He's not a fake. That's the original. Let's keep moving on. Ready? After 62 weeks, 62 sevens, 62 times seven is 434. The Messiah shall be cut off, okay? At exactly 434 years, Jesus went to the cross. That is so awesome. But it says, but not for himself. He got cut off for who? For us. Not for himself, that was added, but for us. Not for himself. The time to command to build Jesus, going to the cross, was 483, 483 years after the decree to build. Okay? That's 69 sevens. 69 sevens to the cross. One seven, one seven-year period is missing. And you think, well, wait a minute. Okay, so you're talking judgment of Israel. 69 weeks, 69 sevens have already been fulfilled one seven is missing for judgment of Israel. Judgment of Israel. One week is missing. So God stopped his time clock, brought in the church a mystery so the world could receive and get saved. Now we're supposed to be judged with Israel. Are you dumb? No, we're not. We actually have to be gotten out of the way. We've got to be taken up. 
We've got to be moved out of the way. Why? Because it has to go back to law. It has to go back to Jewish time for seven years. That's all. The church cannot be a part of the seven-year period of the Jewish time period of Daniel's 70th week. The 490 years are determined for your people. We've got a week left. That week, seven-year period has to be fulfilled. But guess who jumps in there? Antichrist. Who is he? He is what everybody assumes is the Messiah came. No one knows he's Antichrist. They think he's awesome. And the Jews go, you're awesome. You're all, we've been waiting for you. So they sign a covenant. Yay! This is awesome. You may be thinking, don't they read the Bible? No, they don't. How can they don't even know? How can they don't just see this? Because that, you, we do the same thing. I've had a Bible and I didn't even know what it was. I had a Bible in my house for years. I grew up with the Bible. I didn't know what it was. All I knew was, was we're weird, scary. We didn't go to church. We didn't talk about God. We didn't do none of that stuff. But we had a Bible. I think it was like to protect the house. And it, I can tell you right now, it wasn't powerful. I still have it, but it wasn't powerful because my dog chewed the side of it. If it was powerful, my dog would have been dead. I do, I'm serious. I can show you the bite marks on the corner of the Bible. We, it, we didn't know anything about it. But it said all the stuff that it says just right now. It talks about freedom, talks about healing, talks about wholeness. But I had that there. I didn't know it. I didn't live it. I didn't experience it. I didn't know nothing about it. I got saved at nine years old. Nine years old because I went to an altar at a Methodist church that's a funeral home right now. Makes sense. <laughs> got saved. Nine years old. My, parent, my mom didn't. My two brothers, they didn't. It was a night out. It was a summer night. They had an altar call. I, I, don't, I don't know what it was. I just wanted what they were talking about. Nine years old. On my own. Walked up there. They gave me a little chick track and said, say this prayer. Said the prayer. And they sent me home. So what I did is every night, this probably only like about, I don't know how long approximately, maybe like about three or four weeks, I prayed that prayer because they showed this big old, this angel carrying someone to fire and dropping them. And I thought, I don't want to go there. So I, I got saved every night. I didn't know. I didn't know. If you don't have a teacher, you don't have someone to follow, someone to mentor. I didn't know. So all I did is read that thing. Every night I was scared. So I figured, okay, I got to, I got to, I'm talking nine years old. So I opened the Bible because this has to do with the Bible. And I thought, okay, the only thing I know is the Jesus. Because I, I, I said, Jesus, I believe in you. I didn't know what that meant. I just knew what I felt at nine. And so I opened up the Bible and I looked where, because if you see the Bible we had, it's one of those white ones, the ones that look really sanitized and they're like, I don't know, 30 feet tall. And I looked, I looked, I looked, and I found where it said, Jesus said. So I wrote down what Jesus said, and I put these papers all on my wall where Jesus said. I thought, I'm not, I don't know what I'm thinking. All I know is I got to have those things there because I don't want that guy to drop me in this fire. But ultimately, what happened? It went away. You weren't saved. The heck I wasn't. Good thing I didn't say hell. Because I was saved. But guess what? What happened in here doesn't change out here unless this changes. I don't care what happens in here. If you don't change information, you stay the same way. You won't change. You'll try. You do what you can. You'll write down Jesus said. But ultimately, you revert to what you know. See, my parents didn't take me to church. They didn't, we didn't go through Bible studies. It was me, nine years old. I mean, a nine-year-old, come on. You know, they're very limited on being able to follow through with stuff. That was my life. So from that summer on, 
I lived like I wasn't saved. Even got mad at Christians. But in here, I was born again. You might not figure that out, but it doesn't matter about you figuring it out. It's what I know, what my life has experienced, and ultimately what happens. What happens with everybody that receives Jesus? He's going to bring you in. He will. You're going to get brought in. And ultimately, it took me, you know, it took me a little while, 22, where I got in. Fighting with a stinking Christian. Just fighting with this guy. Why? Because in here, I wanted it so mad, so bad. Here, I just was so frustrated. Finally, I succumbed to it fell to my knees, and just let it all out. From that day forward, it's been nothing but Jesus. Nothing but Jesus. Why? Because now I have someone to hold my hand and take me through the process, to show me, to teach me, to have fun with me, to laugh at me, to do all kinds of weird stuff, by the way, with me. They had a lot of fun with me. I was so dumb in the Christian faith. I got so many stories that would crack you up. And they loved it. They loved to watch me be dumb, silly, goofy, not know how to take communion, not know how to pray. They had so much fun. I want to talk to those guys again. They abused me. But it was all with love. It was all with love. Either way, the picture is this. Seven years are determined for the people of Israel. It's got to take place. It has to take place. But the church has to get out of the way. Because if you remember right, if you look at Scripture, you'll understand we have a power and authority over all the enemy. We do. We are a powerful people. We just don't get our power. We lose sight of it because we don't know. We're ignorant. But you have power. You have authority. The Scripture is very clear on that power and authority. You can bind and loose. I mean, you are powerful against the enemy. Resist the devil, and he flees. He runs away. Well, I can tell you right now, if Antichrist shows up, it just takes the youngest Christian to stand up there and go on, I rebuke you. Just through the power of who he is or who she is is going to stop it. So the church has to go out. It has to get out of here. And who is the church? All of you that do good. All of you that don't sin, all of you that stay perfect, all of you that never, ever do bad any longer. Is that crazy? Of course it is. Who goes? All of you that receive Jesus as Lord and Savior are blood bought by that covenant. And you need to understand something. When the trumpet sounds, you going. Yeah, but what if I'm sinning in the midst? You probably will be. The speed limit says 40. You're going 45. Don't say that you should go because of the blood of Jesus. No, you're in sin right now. See how stupid that is? Exactly. But the Christians don't think common sense. They just think of legalistic terms to try to manipulate Christians and fear them into control. Most likely, y'all be in sin. The Bible says when you know to do good and you didn't do it, you walk past, you walk past that paper, you saw it, and you thought, I should pick that paper up and throw it away. But you didn't. According to the Bible, that's sin. And then the rapture comes. You ain't coming. You should have picked the, picture, the paper up. You see what I'm saying? See, we don't want to look at it simple like that because it makes too much common sense. And we start realizing, wait a minute, ain't it about this. It's about the blood of Jesus. It's all about the blood of Jesus. But see, that's what preachers, God, it's so sad that I have to talk this way because they're supposed to be on our side with truth. And to manipulate that is scary. It's ugly. I just can't stand it. Because the grace of God abounds beyond sin. And all they're trying to do is give you this fake false holiness teaching. Listen, with all the rules and regulations of the Old Testament, no one could be holy enough. And all of a sudden, we have a church that Jesus died for, that forgave our sins, and now we're supposed to be holy enough to never, ever sin again? 
It ain't going to happen. Like I said, y'all are sinning all, all the time. You think, no, I don't do those, I don't do those. And then you get on the phone. Did you see what she was wearing? You're in sin, girl. What do you see? Do you, we are so selective on how we sin that we lose sight of it. And that's how we make this blanket judgment statement towards Christ. Well, they're doing this, this, this. And you're gossiping for months. They did that four times. You've been doing it a thousand times. Sin's a sin with God. You've got to understand that. You've got to see it in the Word. Now this ain't about, am I doing good enough? It's about live life. Trust in the grace of God. Trust in what Jesus has done for you and start renewing your mind. You will become better, mature. When you're more mature, you start doing better things. That's all. When you're a teen, you cruise all over the place and lost your license. You grew up and realized, wow, that affects insurance and money and how much I pay. And you mature to start realizing, I'm going to have to be become. Who am I talking about? Not me. Not me at all. Talking about your kids. Of course I'm talking about me. I'm not afraid to say that. That I lost my license because I was out of control. At 18 years old. Thinking I'm in a VW, hopped up, souped up VW Volkswagen bug. And it's, it's like a 396 Chevy. <laughs> Till I had to pay my insurance. Wake up. Parents said, no, we ain't paying. Then life slaps you right upside the head and you thought it isn't the way I thought it was going to be. So now you have to do what? Drive better. Take classes. Defensive driving school. Like 30 times. No, I'm not, I haven't grown up yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. The point is, is this. Stop it. You're the church. You're perfect because of him, his blood. Your actions might not be perfect, but hey, we're going to fix that, right? We're going to grow up, start growing, maturing, making right decisions. Tell you what, just one of the missing traits or Bible studies that the church needs is character, integrity. Being a person that tells the truth. That's what I consider super spiritual. Not the ones that try to present themselves as super spiritual. And they have no character. And there's so many leaders like that. No character at all. Deception. Deception, deception. It's a travesty. But we all know what's right. And that is, we have an awesome Lord and Savior that did it for us. We believe in him. And because of that, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Our lives are tied to him. Now again, we might be doing stupid, we might be doing sin, we might be doing whatever, but it's time to recognize choices are what cause the action. Start changing choices. And when the rapture comes, whenever it does, listen, this was written 2,000 years ago. Maybe it'll be another 2,000. Who cares? It just doesn't matter. Live life strong. Live life big. Don't get freaked out over this because ultimately that seven-year period for Israel is going to happen. And that Antichrist is going to go, yeah, we love you. And in three and a half years, he's going to break it. All about Israel. But ultimately, the seven year ends. It doesn't go to 14, it doesn't go to eight, it doesn't go to nine, the seven year ends. And what happens then? We who are alive and remain, we who are alive and remain have been caught up with him. We've been up with Jesus for seven years, which is like that. Don't think it's seven years like we're gonna be in heaven going, God, oh, what are we gonna do up here? Eternity. It, you won't even, it's, it, I believe it's like we're up and then we're back. Seven years, boom, we come back in a thousand years. Thousand years on this earth. Think of the hunting and fishing then. Oh my gosh. 
whatever you go, you do what you're going to do. I just know what I got. I'm looking at, I'm looking at forests and things like, oh my gosh, it is going to be awesome. Thousand years. Anyway, that's a whole different teaching. Love you guys. I'm so happy to see a lot of you in here and your kids. And I know we've had, we've had people in here for a while now, but I'm glad that you've been set free to come and bring your kiddos in here. I, listen, I cried this morning seeing kids running down the hallway and I've been holding it together really good, really good. I'm telling you, it was so hard, but I'm, I'm just thrilled. And listen, it stuff's ugly out there, but remember, it's all about here, in here. Take this, and this changes. And we're going to make an impact and influence this world. We're not done yet. Until, until Jesus does say, out of here. Right. Rawr, rawr. However the sounds, I don't know what it sounds like. Don't be waiting for that sound. You might miss it. It's, it's a different sound. I don't know what it is. Just know what's going to happen in a twinkling of eye. It says in a moment, in a twinkling. A moment is the Greek word where we get um, Adam. Adam, the, the, you know, small, small particle, right? And we even know that there's smaller particles than that. Protons and all that kind of stuff. The point is, is twinkling, boom, whoop, gone. And then seven years, back. Israel, I mean, Israel was dealt with. Don't worry about the people on the earth there. There's gonna be 1,444 crazy missionary Jews going throughout the world. 1,404, 12,000 from the 12 tribes. 12,000 crazy missionary Jews going around the world saying, you need Jesus, you need Jesus, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. So don't worry about the people because they're going to have an opportunity if they stay here. And if you're a Christian that says, no, we're supposed to go, well, then I'll ask God to keep you down here. I'll pray with you and we'll agree that you stay during tribulation. But I really don't think you want to be here. I think you want to come up and come back down, and it's all good. Amen? Love you guys. Be blessed. See ya.